Let me go back and, and, and analyze the fact that when I said that this phi i is a sum over the basis and the overlap between the basis functions are the original basis functions is s nu mu. I must mention here that we started with spin orbitals which are orthonormal which means my space orbitals for closed shells are also orthonormal. So, I must mention that phi i phi j uh, is also delta i j. However, the atomic orbitals of course, have an overlap matrix. If this was also orthonormal, then of course, you know that this coefficient would have a very simple relation that the Sidagar C would have been identity matrix right, which is what happens when you expand one orthonormal function in another orthonormal set. But this is no longer true here. In fact, what is true is that you have C dagger SC equal to identity matrix. Again, you should be able to prove this as a practice problem. I have just given you all the pieces, okay. So, you, sh you, should, you should be able to see very quickly that the C dagger C cannot be identity matrix, but C dagger SC is identity matrix. Please practice this, you know, everything I will not do here. So, I am just mentioning, but these are, these are things to be proved. If that is so, then you look at the P matrix, P is 2 C C dagger. As, as because the name is P, you may think it is a projection operator, but it is not actually, because projection operators are supposed to be idempotent. If you quickly see, this is not idempotent. So, P is of course a Hermitian matrix that is very clear, but P square is not equal to P. So, if you do P square, it becomes 4 C C dagger C C dagger and of course, this is not 1 and even if it was 1, this 4 would have remained. So, P square would not be equal to P because of this factor 2. So, it is quite clearly it is not an idempotent matrix. That is something that you should get out of your mind because many of you moment I write P think projection operator, it is not really a projection operator. What does this actually, there is an equation it satisfies. Again, you should be able to prove this, okay, from this expression. I give you that expression, try to prove it at home, again practice problem. PSP, what is PSP? 2 CC dagger SC. So, you have C dagger SC, which is identity actually. Yes. So, PSP, but then there is a 2 here is equal to 2P. Again, I will not do this, but I may ask in the mid same exam. It is very easy. I hope all of you will be able to prove this that P S P is equal to 2 P, which actually tells a very interesting thing that in case I would have walked in an orthonormalized basis in and I would have defined my P matrix in using the orthonormalized basis, which means my A mu prime, which is an orthonormal basis, I had a C prime. Remember, the same molecular orbitals are expanded in terms of orthonormalized basis. So, then this will become C prime, this becomes A prime. I define my P with respect to that C prime, new P, let us say P prime. Then of course, you can very easily show that this S is identity matrix. So, you can very easily show that P square is P is still not an idempotent matrix, but can you now tell me what is an idempotent matrix? What function of P will be idempotent matrix in an orthonormalized basis? Let me see how quickly who can come up with an answer. See, for an orthonormalized basis, let us say P prime, you know everything is prime, this is identity, but this is still not idempotent. But some very simple function of P is idempotent. Can somebody tell me? I hope the question is clear. So, I have a P prime. So, P prime S prime is of course identity, 
is still equal to 2 p prime, but this is now identity. I will not write it, I am not deliberately written the identity because it will become even more easy. So, so can you tell me a simple function of p prime which is idempotent, p prime is still not idempotent, you are pretty close, 1 by 2 p prime. 1 by 2 p prime is added because you see here p prime square is 2 p prime divide by 4 p prime square by 4 is p prime by 2 p prime square by 4 is half p prime square is it clear but note note however that this this half p is not an idempotent matrix p defined in an orthonormalized basis so i am talking of half p prime this this of course is not an idempotent matrix that is very clear Okay. So, these are some of the interesting things that you can just play around the algebra of uh, the projection operators and I hope, I hope it is clear everybody can see this why it is so. Simply divide by 4 on both sides. So, you will see that the, the left hand side is p prime by 2 square. So, a very simple function like half p prime in an orthonormalized basis would have been an idempotent matrix, but this by itself is not an idempotent matrix that is clear because of the fact that the basis is not orthonormal, orthogonal and anyway this factor is there. Okay, good. So, <coughs> let us move ahead with further interpretation of the P. Yeah, now very important thing that we can do from charge density bond order matrix is what is called the population analysis. Population analysis actually gives you the number of electrons in each atom or the charge of an atom in a molecule. Now, many of many chemists are always interested that after the molecule is formed, what is the charge? Let us say water molecule, what is the charge of oxygen, what is the charge of hydrogen? Now, I will quite clearly show that that is really an arbitrary thing, but the chemists are so much obsessed with this charge. The charge is an arbitrary thing, neither can it be measured nor can it be calculated exactly. But unfortunately, whole of chemistry depends on that. Particularly in extreme cases like ionic, completely ionic bond, you can of course, the results are invariant. But in all intermediate cases of covalent and ionic, the results are not uh, calculable exactly, they are completely arbitrary. So, I will first show you one important population analysis which was developed by Mulliken. I think many of you have heard this Mulliken population analysis. It is very popular analysis used in Gaussian and many programs and many, many people actually give this population analysis to show what is the charge distribution of an atom in molecule. So, how is it done? I will first show and then I will show why is it arbitrary. So, <coughs> let us go to the definition of density and this is something that we have been doing in density functional class, but at this point I will merely say that given the single determinant, if I integrate psi star psi over all coordinates except one, all space spin coordinate except one and for that one also I will integrate over the spin, then I will get electron density, okay. I will simply write in terms of the spatial molecular orbitals, the result is simply i equal to 1 to n by 2, 2 times phi i star r phi i r. It is very easy to show this actually. Again, you use actually this letter rules to integrate that from the determinant and you get chi i star chi i, each chi i is alpha and beta. So, it is phi i star phi i two times. So, it is very easy that take orbital density multiply by 2 simply because each orbital has two electrons and you get the total density. For as Hartree Fock, it is very easy. So, this is for the closed shell and again I, I, I uh, restrict the discussion for the closed in the closed shell, but it is very easy to generalize, but just by the occupation of the orbitals instead of 2 I will put actual occupation of the orbitals if I have more than n by 2 orbitals, special orbital. So, this is my electron density and that has a very nice interpretation that if I integrate the electron density over the volume element, it is n. So, when I do the, when I calculate the electron density, remember 
in my definition of integral psi star psi over all integration, I multiply by factor capital M so that I get this normalization constant because all of you know that in a system, the integrated electron density is total number of electrons, okay. So that is the reason I, uh, I have to ensure this and it is very clear that that is the case because when I do the integration, you can see that each of the integration gives you 1, 1 multiplied by 2 is 2 and you have a sum over n by 2, so it gets n. So it is very clear that this is following that this uh, particular thing, okay. Now I can expand, start to expand everything in terms of, I can integrate and I can write expressions of n in terms of charge density bond order matrix. So basically what I will do, I will have to expand this phi i's in terms of the atomic orbitals. I hope you should be again able to do, you will get a coefficients, you will get a, a mu, a nu of r integrate because there is an integration, you get an overlap matrix times the two coefficients. Multiply those coefficients, make them projection operator, practice problem, can you show that n is equal to trace of P s or it is sum over mu P s mu mu over the entire basis, this mu is a basis now. Show. I will again not do it, but it is a practice problem, you should be ready before the exam, okay. The strategy is very simple, start from this integration, this rho of r, you substitute this. So you have integral phi i star phi r, whatever 2 sum over i, then each of the phi i you expand in terms of the atomic orbitals. So the integration will be over now atomic orbital basis, which will give me S, the rest of this C star C will give me projection operator. You just show that this value, this I will of course vanish because I will go into the projection operator. Some of our mu and some of our nu will come because of this expansion and you should be first able to show that this is equal to this and hence it is equal to trace. Mu mu is just diagonal element here, yeah. mu mu, not mu nu, mu mu only diagonal element, please you should be able to show this uh, by substituting, by substituting uh, these phi is here and expanding phi is in atomic orbital, then integrate. Of course, it is an integration, so it is a number, n is a number. So what we are seeing, say, showing that if you calculate a new matrix called P s matrix, I have a P matrix, I have a overlap matrix, calculate this P s matrix then take the diagonal element, sum of the diagonal element that is your total number of electrons. Now this gives a very nice <coughs> interpretation. It says that now I can relate n to the basis. Remember my originally n was to the molecular orbitals. What was my, how, how was it related? All n electrons were distributed 2 per each molecular orbital for closed shells. Now I am saying I can distribute the n to the atomic orbitals, saying that each atomic orbital has a contribution from its P s, diagonal element and that sum is equal to n. Obviously it will not be 1 or 2, it will be much, maybe much less because capital M is much greater than n. It is sum over all capital M is equal to capital N. So I can for example have atomic orbital basis, I have P s of 1 1 plus P s of 2 2 all these together will become now capital M. So this gives a very nice interpretation and this is what Mollikan did, that after I construct the molecule, I can now say that the atomic orbitals, my atomic orbitals are such that if I calculate the di diagonal element of P s on those atomic orbitals, I will interpret that that is the population for that atomic orbital and I sum over all such atomic orbitals, which of course are distributed on several atoms will give me total number of electrons. And this is the atoms in molecule picture. So for example, 
in a water molecule I want to now get the number of electrons on oxygen atom. That is trivial because now what I will do I will not sum over all atomic orbitals, but I will sum over atomic orbitals which are centered only on oxygen. Okay? So, that will now that sum will give you number of electrons on oxygen and subtract that from the charge of the oxygen you get the formal charge. Okay? So, let us say so I can define a charge of an atom A as N A uh, one minute here. Let me write this as some Q A as Z A which is the atomic number minus sum over P S mu mu, but now mu is not summed from 1 to m, mu is summed over all the atomic orbitals which are centered on A. Remember my m atomic or bases are distributed on different atoms. So, I will only pick up that particular atom, sum over all P S mu mu, that becomes my total number of electrons and of course, I divide from the charge Z A that gives me uh, the, uh, the atomic charge Z A that give nuclear charge that gives me the charge of the atom. So, if it is more than 8 for example, if this is more than 8 that means it is a negative charge. You have more number of electrons than 8 on the oxygen atom which is what is going to happen if you do a calculation of water and that is what you report Mulligan population analysis alright. Very nice except that now I will tell you some stories that this is not the only way to do it. And I can keep telling you any number, you have to believe that number. And that is why population analysis is arbitrary. Because this is, there is actually there is no experiment to show this. That this is the charge of oxygen in water molecule. And that is the problem. P is for the whole molecule. S is also for the, P is actually coefficient. Yeah, for the, it is atomic orbital. It is also in the atomic orbital. S is also an atomic orbital. So, P S is also over the whole molecule but on the atomic orbital basis now. So, that is the important thing. Once I can recover my number of electrons based on atomic orbitals, I can now re uh, recover number of electrons for an atom by simply summing over those basis functions which are centered on atom. Total sum will be n because this is very sum, this is very simple. Yeah, because, because I am summing only over the atom A. So, I will, so these are my each atomic orbital. So, the contribution of all oxygen atomic orbitals is my total number of electrons on oxygen that is how it is interpreted. It is a population of that orbital. So, I am summing over only oxygen P s of oxygen. This is the total sum. The trace is the total sum. I am taking diagonal elements of those atomic orbitals which are only on A. So, I will say that is my total number of electrons on A. No, I mean that is a pop okay. I mean this is if you say that this is my interpretation. Yes, I agree that when I have got this result, I am now interpreting that each P s mu mu is the number of electrons on that atomic orbital. That is an interpretation. Yeah, I agree, but that was the Mullikan interpretation because then the sum comes out very nicely. Okay, so, that, that seems to be quite logical interpretation actually. I have no problem with that interpretation, but I will say even with that interpretation, I have arbitrary definition. That is what I am going to show now. Okay? So, note that however, if this P was formed on an orthonormalized basis again I repeat that means if it was P prime then of course if you just take trace of P prime that would have been total number of electrons okay in an orthonormalized basis basis would have changed. So, if I would have formed the projection operator on that basis so I call it P prime okay then P prime would have been sufficient because S is not there but that is a triviality one minute one minute one I, I am talking of this one are, are you talking of this one that is what I am asking you. This is integer, this is what I have asked you to show. So, when you show this is integer, but this need not be an integer. I am not said that the charge of an oxygen atom is always an integer. They say minus 0.2, and that is the reason. This, however, is integer, and you have to show this. I have not shown this. So, this is obviously an integer, but when I am taking a sum over mu on centered on a particular atom, it need not be an integer. But sum of A, sum of B, sum of C, whatever number of atoms, the total leg would be again integer and that is number of N, we have shown this. Mulli can use this for his definition of charge. The charge of, this is, this is the charge, this is the atomic number Z A and this is the 
P s. What I was mentioning is that if this P would have been calculated in an orthonormalized basis, then of course S is not required, it would be only P or P prime. I would call it P prime, whatever. So that is much better because this P s is more difficult to construct. Then P prime has a direct significance. Here I do not have. So although I am calling it charge density bond order matrix, in terms of charge density P s has a direct significance, not P. But that is because of only this problem is coming only because of orthogonalization of basis. In an orthonormalized basis, P directly with this. But now what I want to tell you that this is even with this interpretation, there is a complete arbitrariness because you know that the trace is invariant under commutation. Okay? So, for example, trace of P s, first I can write this as trace of P s to the power half, let us say s to the power half. You agree? Because s to the power half, s to the power half, then associative law of multiplication and the trace is invariant under commutation. So, now what I can do? I can push this here. So, it is very easy to show that this is also equal to trace s to the power half p s to the power half. All these trace would be equal to number of electrons n, no question. But now I can use for example, and this is what Lovedin did, use this as the population analysis. So now what Lovedin did was to calculate charge on Z a minus s to the power half p s to the power half mu 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 centered on a. The problem is the following, while this quantity is invariant, this quantity is not invariant because this is not entire trace, this is sum over only selected one and then the results will be different, charge will now be different. So what is the charge? Of course, some of the total charges will be constant that has been defined by the molecule, if it is a neutral water molecule, some of the charges will be 0, but charge on each atom is arbitrary. This particular one is called the Lovedin population analysis. This is very popular as well with Mulliken, just like Lovedin orthogonalization. You look at Lovedin, Lovedin did s to the minus half, Lovedin did s to the half, p s to the half, Lovedin likes everything symmetric. You will get about that man, this is symmetric, this is unsymmetric. You have only Lovedin said, why s should go only on one side? Of course, Trace is invariant, so it could have been sp, that is also equally bad. This is a distributed. Beautiful, Lovedin was a great mathematician, incidentally. They are equal, you agree? But this quantity is not equal. Why? Because the entire trace is invariant. This is not the trace, this is only sum over selected number. So the theorem says that the sum over all is invariant, the theorem itself has sum over all. Here you do not have sum over all. So there would be a cancellation. Okay, so that is why you get different charge. So this is Mulliken. This is Lovedin, and of course you can have your own charges. No problem. You can somebody can say no no no. I will put left little less. I can put s to the zero point one, p s to the point nine. No problem. The overall it has to be s. But the S can be redistributed any way you like and I can keep getting population analysis. Just to show you interpretation is same, I still get different results. There's nothing called right because charge is not experimentally determined. So anyway, there is nothing called right. Charge and I, 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 I dare say that the charge is an imagination by a theoretician. Theoretician does not believe itself, but the experimentalists believe that. Because experimentalists cannot calculate charge, but entire interpretation of why a reaction has taken place is based on charges. So they use Mulliken, Lovedin, whatever suits their need. Yeah. But I must say these are the two most popular, Mulliken and Lovedin. There are many others, yes. There are Hirschfeld charge, Hirschfeld charges, I do not want to go into that. I myself have written several papers based on the reactivity and Hirschfeld charges and I, I will show that if you calculate reactivity which is Fukui function, neither Mulliken nor Lovedin is better according to me, Hirschfeld is the best, but not for charges, only for reactivity and I wrote three papers in JCP 
99, 2000, 2001, you can check on three long papers on why Hirschfeld is good. Yeah, but dipole moment is an overall thing, sum of everything. You can still fit it to, you can still fit it to different charges. I can still model in a different way. That's not a direct measurement, really speaking. Okay. So I will come to dipole moment later. I think uh, tomorrow I'm going to also now tell you how to calculate dipole moment through the P. It's also very nice. All right. So I think I'll stop here. So uh, just to tell you that the charge density, you can already see why charge density. I will now tell you why bond order tomorrow and how this can be also used for dipole moment calculation. If you just have P, but P is always in atomic orbital. So whenever I do P something, it is all sum over atomic orbital, no longer molecular orbitals. Okay. So that is very important. And this is also the charge density bond order matrix is very important because there is a whole class of theories which are called atoms in molecules, AIM. These atoms in molecules essentially mean that once a molecule is formed, you want to get back atomic character. And the, your P, your P is the vehicle. P gives you that. So P is a very, very important matrix. Everything has to be done through P because P is what? It is the coefficient of an atomic orbital for a molecular orbital. So that is why it's sum over all. So P gives you, if you look at P, expression of P, you have P mu nu is 2 times sum over I equal to n by 2 C mu I, C nu I star, right? So if you look at each of the P diagonal element, let us say diagonal element, it is a contribution to A mu is equal to nu, contribution to an atomic orbital from all molecular orbitals. So I am now doing the reverse. I initially said a molecular orbital from all atomic orbitals. Now an atomic orbital from all molecular orbitals. So P allows me to do the reverse. So in all AIM picture, P is a key quantity. Okay, so just remember this charge density bond order matrix. And so when you say bond order, it is also atoms in molecule picture. After molecule is formed, now we are saying how many electrons are there between two atoms, okay, for bonding. So all those pictures, the P is very, very important. Otherwise, you could never get it. But unfortunately, as I showed you for chart, there is an arbitrariness because of this mathematics. This mathematics and, and Lovedin cleverly exploited this to find another charge. And he claimed this is better. In many cases, this is better because his claim to this is basically because it is symmetric. He said, I have redistributed this one with 0.5 and 0.5. Okay, so that is why I think it is good. Okay, so I will stop here today.